The recording is in progress, and I am thrilled to see you all um, bright and early and perfectly on time. And welcome to uh, uh, Green Salon number one of the Sustainable uh, Initiative. It's great to see some, I know many of you, some familiar faces here. Uh, I think because we're all here, we're just going to jump in. I'm going to pass to Paul Yannon for a minute and, and start our presentation. Hi there, everyone. I want to thank every single person here for being able to join. Um, AppCore and the 100% Core campaign are incredibly pr proud to actually welcome you to uh, sustainability salon series that we're running. Um, once again, sustainability is a, is a big, big, big topic right now, especially in the age of climate change. We're heading into summer when we know that there's always going to be a potential challenge or threat um, regarding harvest season upcoming and heat, drought. There's a number of factors that are uh, going to be important for everyone to be able to you know, discern how to move forward as a wine industry. Um, there's going to be uh, a ton of great panelists, uh, experts in their fields, a ton of great winemakers uh, and, and winery partners um, that we will bring into this. Um, and there is a wonderful you know, set of certifications too that we'll be highlighting as well. So you'll be hearing directly from the source, from the people who matter. You'll be able to sort of see the challenges, see the opportunities and get to discuss uh, real talk amongst a small closed group here um, so we can all better understand what sustainability is, what the challenges are, how do we overcome them, and are there ways in which we can all work harder um, to get consumers, wholesalers, retailers, restaurant uh, and on-premise teams, as well as wineries, all being on the same page about how we need to be better and improve understanding of sustainability moving forward. Um, I would like to introduce uh, a wonderful uh, moderator, Liza Zimmerman, who will be hosting all of our salons uh, over the coming months. Um, Liza has previously worked uh, for Shankin, has in the Industry Insider, knows a lot of you particularly well, knows a lot of the uh, wineries too. Um, she's been writing, educating, consulting um, on a number of you know, different categories over the years. So she's an excellent person to be able to address this topic and address all of you at the same time. Um, once again, AppCore is you know, uh, probably one of the, if you've never heard of AppCore, we are the association that helps uh, represent all of the stakeholders for the cork industry. So that means cork forests, cork harvesters, producers who use cork, um, and cork being one of the most you know, natural um, and reusable and recyclable materials, we thought it would be appropriate for cork to really, really be the ones who can talk about sustainability. Understand that you know, sustainability is a big topic. You know, cork being a environmentally positive material is one part of that matrix. But there are so many elements, including you know, water conservation, solar regenerative energy, um, you know, working with uh, communities and working with employees for human sustainability efforts to ensure that we all have a winery, um, sort of a wine industry to work with over the next you know, 50 plus years. So I'm going to pass over to Liza. Um, there's going to be some great conversations and there will be an opportunity um, for everyone to be able to ask questions. Um, there is uh, uh, two colleagues of mine, uh, Augustus Weed and Benjamin Nyland from our team. They are saying hello right now. If you have any questions while any of our panelists um, are, are talking, um, please feel free to chat them. Uh, we will funnel your questions to Liza and to the panelists. There will also be, following everyone's uh, Q&A session, uh, another two or three minutes um, in which we'll be able to field questions as well. Everyone should have the ability, if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, to see a reaction button. There is a symbol there that says raise hands. As you can see, I'm high-fiving myself with a raised hand symbol. Um, we can see that. And so anyone who does want to ask a question following um, everyone's uh, Q&A and presentation, uh, we will be able to address you afterwards. But while everyone's talking, please funnel your questions via chat to Benjamin Nyland and Augustus Weed, and we'll take care of you. Um, Every person will be able to uh, also have an opportunity to ask a question at the end, um, depending on sort of how we go with timing. Um, yeah, I think it's going to be a great conversation. Today's topic is 
why can't more entry-level wines be sustainable? You know, we have some great panelists here who can answer those questions, shine a light on what is happening in the marketplace, what are the consumer trends to look out for, and possibly some of the challenges that every retailer is facing right now in getting people to understand what sustainability is and how to support it. I will pass it over to Liza. Thank you so much, Paul. It, it's great to see a lot of familiar faces. It's great to see some new faces here. So our first presenter is going to be Dr. Stephanie Bolton, who um, leads grower research, education, communication initiatives, um, along with the Lodi Rules Sustainable Wine Growing Certification Program. And she oversees about 750 wine growers. And interestingly enough, and she'll delve into this, the program also exists in, in Israel. So I'm going to ask her a couple questions and um, and she will take your questions afterwards. So tell us, Dr. Bolton, um, a little bit about what you do at Lodi Rules. Sure, and thank you, Liza, and thanks everyone for being here. I think it's really important to have these candid conversations about sustainability, and we appreciate um, the organizers for putting this, this salon together. So together with a group of dedicated growers, I lead the program, and that means something different every day, right? I'm on speaking on this panel today. Tonight, I'll be at the local farmer's market teaching the children about ag biodiversity. Sometime tomorrow, I have to find a few hours to dig through vineyard input risk data and analyze that for improving our program. And then next week, I hope to launch the review of the fourth edition of our Lodi Rules standards to the growers so that they can provide input and feedback. Um, so it's super fun. Uh, I love my job and I love working with the farmers and the wineries and then all the different people that we get to interact who are interested in learning about what does sustainability mean. So can you talk us through what Luda Rules is as a certification and the winery members, the wine grower members, what does the process cost? Because I, I'd like throughout the salon to kind of focus on cost because the topic in question is why can't more wine wineries be sustainable at around the under 17 price point? Um, and what does the process cost and does that cost add to the bottom line? Does it need to add to the bottom line cost of the wine in question? Sure. And Paul, if you'll pull up slide nine, I think that would help illustrate this point. So the for those of you who don't know, the Lodi Rules program was started around 1992 as a grassroots integrated pest management program. And then over time, with a lot of different input from leading environmentalists, farmers, um, scientists, extension personnel, viticulturists, et cetera, the program grew in, into a formal certification program in 2005, um, certifying about six different growers in their vineyards. And um, so it's a, the program certified, third-party certified, third-party accredited, third-party audited, and certifies vineyards on an annual basis. So wines that purchase Lodi Rules certified grapes are allowed to use one of our seals on their wine label, as long as 85% of the grapes were certified in the program, certified sustainable. And we do have different seals, Lodi Rules seal, California Rules seal, and we'll, we'll be showing those throughout this talk. And then, um, like Liza said, there's just hundreds of growers in the program. So last year, we certified over 64,000 acres of vineyards across California in Washington State and in Israel. So although the program started in Lodi, it's now spread outside of Lodi. And we have over 70 wineries that are registered to be able to use one of those seals on their labels. Um, as far as fees go, the growers are the ones who pay the fees. And so slide 10 Paul shows the breakdown of the fees and all of this is transparent. It's all on our website, LodiGrowers.com. There's a Lodi Rules tab that you can click on on that website to learn more. So a lot of people might not realize that not all vineyards, a lot of Americans, at least uh, when I was selling wine, so I did sell wine like many of you uh, a few years back, maybe 10 years ago in Atlanta. Um, so a lot of people don't realize that not all vineyards are owned by or you know attached adjacent to a winery. So there's a lot of vineyards that they have to find a way to sell their grapes to wine grape buyers who then make the wine. And so um, that's mostly what Lodi California is. We're mostly vineyards. We only have about 85 wineries here. If any of you have a dream of starting a winery, we'd love to have you. We think that if we had more wineries here, we could... Um, increase our profitability as a region. So let me know if you're interested in that. But we do have about um, 90 to 100,000 acres of vineyards here in Lodi and most people sell 
sell their grapes. So that's why our certification process focuses on certifying the vineyards. And so you can see the breakdown of the fees here. And um, there is also an added cost to the farmers of increased record keeping and implementation of the sustainability practices. But what we've found through feedback is that over time, they're a more profitable business, right? Because that's one of the core elements of sustainability is, is economic feasibility and, and profitability. So what's great is that a lot of wineries recognize the value in a vineyard certification and they started paying a bonus to farmers for, um, for the, the price per ton of grapes. So for example, it might mean that um, you might get $25 per ton as a bonus if you're certified sustainable. And wineries like Bogle Winery, Michael David Winery, and Lane Twins Winery have helped, literally we've tracked it, and they've helped put millions of dollars back in the pocket of farmers to implement sustainability. Dr. Bolton, I, I got a question from one of the attendees. It was something I was going to ask you, and I'll ask some of the other panelists. Uh, how do you define sustainable? I think for for many of us, I mean, I had one journalist who decided not to take this call, unfortunately, because she said, I'm so confused about the topic. I don't even want to stay, you know, on the Zoom for another hour. But what is the organic, green, sustainable? What, what's the difference? How do you define sustainable? Yeah, so if you want to pull up slide four, Paul, um, that's got the sustainability definition on it that, that most programs um, in America use, well, all programs in America use. So uh, sustainability means farming in a way that is environmentally and socially responsible. So slide, I think slide four, Paul has the definition. There you go. So farming in a way that's both environmentally and socially responsible while also being profitable or economically viable. And um, I get that it's confusing, but I, but what I think it's important to know is that it is well-defined and it is transparent. So taking care of the environment, taking care of the community and the people who work on the farm in the farming operation or the winery and, and being profitable as a business for the long term. And what we've done to kind of um, ease some of the confusion around it is we, you know, we've put this definition up all over the place, but we've also, um, taught our our farmers and the wineries who use a seal really how to explain sustainability in their own words. And I think that they've been really appreciative of having that permission to talk about sustainability using examples that make sense to them and that can resonate with their particular audiences. Um, about how many member wineries um, make wine at the sub? And are we considering, I, I put out $17 as sort of the accessible, affordable price point. When we were discussing, you know, our terms for the salon, we were between under 15, under 20, under 17. But how many, um, I know that um, some, I think Jeff had asked about that. So I would say under 17, under 20. How many of them are making wines in the sub 20 price point, Dr. Bolton? Sure. So if you put up slide one, I just pulled a few examples of wine um, wineries that are producing bottles in that price range. And what was interesting to me is that before this salon was organized, I didn't realize that there was confusion around the availability of wines below $17 a bottle being able to be sustainable because we just have so many examples of those. So you can see there's McManus, E Street Crew, Oak Ridge, who makes OZV, that's pretty um, popular around the country. Bogle, Clinker Brick, Lane Twins, Michael David. And then how do you know that these wines are certified, you know, produced with certified sustainable grapes? Well, you look for that seal that's either on the back of the wine bottle on the label or on the wine tech sheet. And um, so there's really dozens and dozens of wineries, not just in Lodi, but across California and beyond using one of these seals and producing great uh, wine from certified sustainable grapes at this price point. Um, so there's thousands and thousands and thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of bottles. I pulled out some numbers um, yesterday, you know, McManus is at least 450,000 cases, Bogle's 2.3 million cases of the winery. So there's tons of wine out there, um, affordable wine carrying a certified sustainable seal. There's a lot of curiosity uh, about Israel <laughs> from the attendees. And um, you're also active in Washington state, I take it, but not in Oregon. Um, but can, no, no. Mm -hmm. 
Can you talk to us about how Israel became part of this program? Because that's pretty exciting. Yeah, so um, Victor Schoenfeld with Golan Heights, he searched the world, and this is these are in his words, not mine. So he searched the world for a rigorous, scientifically found, sustainable certification program for um, for him to participate in and his winery to participate in the estate that um, really carried a lot of meaning and value. He didn't want something that was greenwashing and they really studied all of the different programs available and chose Lodi Rules as the program. And then we had to um, decide as a program, you know, can we certify vineyards in Israel? So we worked with our third party nonprofit Protected Harvest to determine, okay, are the growing conditions similar enough where we can say the set of farming practices that we developed here in California are applicable for Israel. And they decide, yes, that is a valid, that is um, a valid expansion of the program. And the same thing happened with Washington state. So yeah, there, if you follow Golan Heights on Instagram, they really do a great job explaining their sustainability. So I'm going to ask one more question, I think, and then I'm going to open it up to the panelists just so we stay uh, on time here. But can you give us an example of the marketing of sustainability that was targeted at consumers and what was the result and other things you're doing to make consumers aware of sustainability in the market? Yeah, sure. I think if you pull up the slide with the nugget, the nugget promo slide three, that would be a good illustration. So we've done just, well, I think it's first of all important to understand that the reason why a lot of people might be confused is that this is all still new. So the certification program started in 2005, right? That's what, 17 years ago. So it's not that long ago. Time flies by, right, everyone? And at first we were just focused on, let's create a rigorous program that the farmers will use and that the farmers can find value in. So really the first target audience was the growers. And then let's get the wineries interested in buying certified sustainable grapes. So the second you know, big hump to get over was getting the wineries interested. And then we started um, just as, as recent as 2017, I would say really marketing the concept to consumers because we need the consumers to find the value for the wineries to continue um, to be interested in, in supporting sustainability certification as well. So this slide shows an example of a promotion we did last fall. And we believe that promoting sustainability period, not just our seal and our logo and our program, but promoting sustainability and educating others on what sustainability means is important to the um, overall goal of people getting it, getting the message. And um, so we created this fun infographic um, and it was up in Nugget Markets in their wine department for the fall. Maybe you saw it, Liza. And so we promoted all the different seals people could find in Nugget that had, um, that showed the consumer that that wine was produced sustainably and actually, you know, on a certified, because just the word sustainable isn't enough. Um, you you can't necessarily trust that, unfortunately. So really seeing one of these logos will, will be helpful. Um, we had some questions about packaging from Sarah, but I think both Ben and Ryan are going to address packaging in their upcoming presentations and uh, discussion with me. Are there other questions for Dr. Bolton from the attendees? Okay, Ryan, you have a question, it seems. Yeah, I was just wondering um, why the focus on seals on back labels? And I noticed on the sheet where you had all the bottle shots too, um, why, why not feature the sustainable seals on the front? Yeah, so there were a few wineries that in our today, a few wineries that are using a seal on the front of the label. I think that the consumer is still making their first decision based on price, kind of look of the label, producer, variety, um, maybe recognize, you know, do I recognize this? Does it look like something that I would like? I think that the sustainability certification is kind of a deeper layer of purchasing decisions. And um, I, I think that there's just the real estate on the front of the bottle is, is really tight, right? Really high. So Ryan, my dream is that we have, just like the Italians, we have a little strip that goes around the neck of the bottle. You know how they have in Italy a DOC, DOCG? My dream, and I, I actually used to carry around a little example of it 
um, for years in my purse and I would bring it out in these conversations of what I think it should look like. Uh, it would require some finagling on the bottling lines, which is a challenge, but I think having a strip around the neck to show a sustainability certification uh, would be really, really beneficial for our industry. And maybe we lump that in with uh, organic and regenerative and biodynamic, just so it's all together as a certification of something that's pro environment. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I'll touch on it in my piece later on, but I, I would love to see that starting to move to the front label, because I think especially in this value price point, that can be a, a strong selling point. So I would I would encourage folks to move that to prime position on the front. Thank yeah, you so absolutely. much. Yeah, D Dr. Bolton, I think if we have time at the end for more questions, I just would like to keep us running on schedule. So up next is Benjamin Nyman. Um, he's the production and procurement manager at Shannon Family Estates in beautiful Lake County. Um, and he is going to address um, how he produces sustainable wine. And we'll discuss that further. Take it away, Ben. You're muted. Oh uh, yeah, I'm unmuted now. Hi everyone. I am Ben, like she, like she just said. Um, welcome all here. And I have a lot to talk about um, as a winery. So I want to, you know, cover a lot, a lot of points because uh, Dr. Bolt, uh, Dr. Bolton brought up a lot of good points that I, I want to elaborate on. But first and foremost, what do I do? Um, at wineries, uh, everyone recognizes the winemaker. It's like a film. Everyone recognizes the director, um, but they don't necessarily realize who's actually doing everything. And that would be uh, my position or supply chain managers or a lot of behind the scenes people. I make all the procurement packaging decisions. I bring uh, brands to life. I've brought, uh, brought a lot of retail brands to life for retail chains as well. I've worked with some people here in the past. Um, and so I'm the one really, really putting the pieces together and ensuring that what we deliver is an eco-friendly product. Um, and the reason I think that is the most important is first and foremost, wine is an agriculture product. We cannot make wine if there are no grapes. We cannot grow grapes if the soil is shot, if it's too hot, if the climate no longer can support grapes. So it is like the most fundamental thing that a winery can do to make sure that it lasts for another 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, uh, is to make sure that its land and its practices are keeping the, the grapes alive and quality so that we can continue making wine. Um, you know, I'd say, I think the statistic is 96 to 98% of US wine comes from California. And we wanna keep it that way. It's a great growing place, but it can change. And the climate is changing. Grapes that grew really well in Napa, and uh, are growing better in other places. You're starting to have grapes growing in Washington and Oregon, you know, that the, the world is changing rapidly and we need to figure out ways to preserve our agriculture and our business. Um, so what, what I wanted to delve in with a little bit, that's a little bit of, about why it's so important to be sustainable, but the sustainability certification in a, in a whole nother aspect is, is immense because you can say you're sustainable. I have solar on my roof and I recycle. I am a sustainable person, but a sustainable certification means uh, that you are, are auditing yourself. <laughs> um, it's huge. You can't be sustainable unless you are measuring your waste, your CO2 outputs and your water outputs and your energy outputs and improving. If you're not improving on your audits, you, you can't be sustainable. You can't claim that on your wine. And so it is, it is, it's, it's hard. Um, as you can imagine, we use a lot of water in wine production and grape production. Um, we use a lot of energy and it's the, the good thing is I'd say, uh, sustainable vineyards are becoming the norm on the grape growing aspect. And I love seeing it. I mean, people are starting to delve further as we are, uh, in organic and, and regenerative farming certificates. But sustainable on the grape side is becoming the norm. Sustainable on the winery side is a little bit of a harder feat um, because you're right, you're dealing with packaging. You're dealing with a lot of CO2 emissions, moving your glass from China, moving your glass across the states in big diesel trucks, getting four miles a gallon, you know? And, uh, and so the fact that we have sustainability on our label and are starting to and have the seal shows that not only are grapes sustainable, but they also come from 85% of our facilities, which are both certified sustainable now. So we are doing our best to make sure that we are always improving. And on 
and the seal keeps us liable. Um, it, it keeps us transparent and you know that we're committed um, from the top of our organization. Uh, I have a, a little anecdote sort of, but uh, there's a mountain and uh, it's more of a hill in Rome. It's called Mount uh, Testaccio and it's not actually a hill. Uh, it was discovered that it is actually comprised of about 53 million clay amphoras from the Roman Empire. I had no idea I lived in Rome. And <laughs> yes, went to um, it looks like a hill. You would there, not know. So, yeah. <laughs> and uh, 53 million clay amphoras. And imagine the output and me, I'm responsible buying glass because I'm. I, it's about numbers. It's about how many tons of fruit, how many gallons of wine, how many bottles. And then when it gets to retail, what's moving? What UPCs are moving? What's moving on the shelf? It's always about an in and an out. And nobody's thinking about the post-consumer waste. And uh, I mean, if we have a mountain existing from post-consumer waste from specifically the wine industry in the Roman empire. Imagine the toll that our wine production is, is having on the world now. So that is, that is our motivation as wineries, not only just for marketing and for sales, but it is a, it is a, uh, it's sustaining our life. <laughs> you know, pretty soon we'll be making spirits if we can't grow grapes. And that's just the reality of it. Um, but we love wine and we love what we do and it's a craft. And um, I think that's why you're all here because you love selling wine and uh, we're here to keep it alive. So that's a little bit about sustainability and why it's so important on the winery side. Um, so I have a couple questions for you, yeah, but I wanted to, to point out, I hope everybody's received their sample of a Shannon family Sauvignon Blanc. So you, you have an idea of what um, Ben is doing, like actually within the bottle. Yeah, so, can I have a slide real quick about that before, sure. before we go on? I don't want to get to get lost. But if you look at the bottle you have now, we have, um, if you want to bring up my slide, we've got a uh, tiny references on the front and back label that you really have to read to find out that it's sustainably farmed using grapes that are sustainably farmed. Um, and, you know, because we can't claim a sustainability logo unless it's going or at least California sustainable, unless it's being processed in a sustainable winery as well. But if you look at our new label that we're coming out with the next vintage, so you're drinking the 2021, which is actually using transitional organic grapes. If you look at the label for 2022, which I'm going to release in November, you're getting a sneak peek. You're going to see we've got made with organic grapes right on the front label. It's not the seal, but it is a huge statement. These are made with organic grapes. Then um, if you switch to the next slide, we've got... Um, the back label. And so the back label, once again, says made with organic grapes, but it also shows CCOF certified organic and certified sustainable winery and grapes. So it's a huge, it's a huge uh, flex, I guess, having those seals because it means that we're committed. It means that we've gone through the, certi the rigorous certification processes that we're auditing ourselves in the organic level. I mean, the, the, the Sauvignon Blanc you're drinking is a I'd say maybe a $13 bottle of Sauvignon Blanc right now, and it is certified organic. So you can see that cost isn't, it can be an issue, but, but the reality is if this is our biggest volume brand, the biggest impact brand, then we need it to be sustainable. Otherwise we don't practice what we preach and we're not making a difference in the world. So we, we are, are doing our planning and growing methods and business decisions around sustainability. We aren't cutting corners. We, uh, you know, organic farming is huge because it focuses on the soil of, of, the, of the vineyards and focuses on the health of the soil. So it's taking your quality even to a deeper level. Um, but first and foremost, sustainability is the one certification that you get audited on. So anyway, I wanted you to see how, how important it is and how hard it is to have those seals on your label. So we couldn't even have the seals on the label you're drinking now. Now we'll be able to. Now we're certified. So it's something that we're really excited about. And can you speak to the costs of these certification, the level of investment? And then Sarah is also interested in what the specific specs on the winery side are for certification. Of course, the winery, the winery certification measures um, in it's different than vineyard in a little bit, but it measures your water consumption, your energy consumption and your your emissions, basically um, your CO2 carbon footprint. It does take packaging into consideration. For instance, we can't show an improvement in our wastes categories if, uh, if, we're, if we're using heavy bottles. So, so the first thing I've got to do is lighten the weight of all our bottles. 
Um, and that, that'll show an, an improvement on the weight because it's measured in weight. How much weight of glass are we, are we using and how much weight of, uh, it kind of translates into the, the trekking and the CO2 emissions by weight. How efficient are you running your trucks? Um, you know, we've even taken it so far as I own my own fleet of trucks, not me, but our company and I run them so that I can make sure they're being ran efficiently and being sure that they're full and full on both ways. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a philosophy, not just a certification. You have to do everything to always improve um, and, and to lower your carbon footprint. So packaging is huge um, and it's measured in pounds of waste basically for our certification. Can you speak to some of the costs of yeah. the certification, how it's reflected in the bottom line cost of the bottle level of investment? The cost of certification is mainly an opportunity cost and a time cost. You know, on the scale of our companies now, the certification licensing isn't very expensive in the scheme of uh, expenses. However, I would say it's definitely an opportunity cost. Um, when you've got to pick your grapes and you don't have space at your winery and you've got to send them to another winery to get crushed, you can't just send them anywhere. Now you have to make sure you're sending them to somewhere that's also certified sustainable, also shares your values and it limits your options. Um, for, for glass and packaging, uh, it's very convenient just to grab whatever bottle is available right now uh, with the supply chain issues happening in the world. If it's available, I want it. However, I can't take it. You know, I have to, I have to look at bottles under 450 grams, under 500 grams. I have to really maximize what fits in a truck. And, um, and that's a challenge too. And that's a little bit of a lost business, uh, lost business too. I don't get to produce things as immediately. Um, I have to take more conscious decisions and efforts. And, um, you know, as our fruit does end up being a little bit more expensive, but we're buying our own fruit. So it's, it's a little bit different of a model. Um, we're sort of buying it at cost. I would say that there is no reason that anybody couldn't do this at any level. Um, in fact, if you're buying lighter graph, if you're buying lighter glass, you're paying less money for it. So it's almost a win-win. Um, are all your wines sustainable, by the way, Shannon's? All our vineyards, we have about 1,500 estate acres, and they've been 100% certified sustainable for 10 years. Um, however, 1,000 acres of them are now fully organic, CCOF organic, and the rest, the other 500 acres, will be in the next three years. So, And then, and then we're already looking at regenerative farming. Uh, regenerate, I can't even say it. Regenerative Forget it. <laughs> yeah, we, we get it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and biodynamic only because it's not always just about the, the certifications. It's about, is the vineyard really going to last the next 30 years? And how do we change our methods now to make it last? Um, um, there's a lack of water already. We know that. So how do we plant vines and farm them so that they don't need water? Do you have a sense bottom line, the cost it adds to a bottle of wine? Like you could make it not sustainable for 11 bucks and cost two bucks a bottle to. No, I, I don't think so. Uh, I think that you can, I, I honestly think that anything could be sustainable and I don't think there's a bottom line cost. Um, you know, we could probably hire a cost accountant to really delve into every specific component in detail, but, but the reality is, um, it's more of a, a conscious decision-making process and, and the, the cost usually ends up being in, in opportunity. Um, our, our, our wine isn't becoming more expensive because of sustainability efforts. It's becoming more expensive because of inflation and, and the cost of goods right now. <laughs> Does cork, using cork in the wines add to the cost? That's a question from Paul and a good one. I mean, I, I don't want to delve too much into it. The, the range of corks can, the range of cost of corks definitely uh, is a wide range. You can spend a dollar a bottle or more on a cork, or you can spend eight cents on a cork. So to me, no, the cork is not a cost inhibitor for, for uh, our sustainable packaging. In fact, it's, it's beneficial. The cork comes with a negative CO2, uh, like, uh, measurement. So, so basically we have a carbon footprint. I buy it when I buy one cork, it comes with negative 200 grams of carbon footprint. So I'm almost buying myself some sustainability by using corks, um, because of the, the way the, the trees, the cork trees are sequestering CO2 in the air and the, and the huge added benefit from that. 
So I, I like using corpse because of that. Um, it offsets kind of the, the glass. Um, glass is recyclable, but it takes a lot of energy to burn down and to melt. Um, so it's not, it's sustainable and it's not sustainable. It depends how you look at it. It's very heavy and hard to move across the country. It takes a lot of fuel to do so. So, uh, I'd like to offset that as much as I can. And then cork is one, one of the ways to do it. I'm going to open it up to a question or two for Ben, if you have one before we move on to the next speaker, does anyone have anything I haven't addressed? And if there's time at the end, we could obviously go back and, you know, revisit questions with Ben and Dr. Bolton. Okay, so next up is Sandra Taylor, um, who I had the good fortune to meet at a wine conference in Napa. She's the president and CEO of um, Sustainable Business International. She's a published author. And when I started chatting with her about this project, I said the, the focus of this session is why can't more sustainable wines be affordable under the $17 or $20 price point? And she said, but so many of them are. So I said, fantastic. Why don't you join us and, and discuss what you do and why you feel like so many of them are available at those price points. So please tell us more about what you do, Sandra. Thank you, Liza. I, um, well, I run a consulting business. Um, I spent a career in uh, working for corporations running sustainability. Uh, most the most recent corporation I worked for was Starbucks, um, and I've studied wine a lot. Um, obviously, a lot of similarities between coffee and wine. Um, my my approach really is to figure out how do we persuade consumers to purchase sustainably produced products, and in this case, sustainable wines, because it's one thing for producers to make things sustainable, but consumers have to buy it. And increasingly, uh, younger consumers are very conscious, obviously, of sustainability. Uh, Gen Z, millennials are very uh, concerned about sustainability. Um, and Interestingly, many of them, I mean, there's been lots of research that says when interviewed, people say, oh, yeah, I'm willing to pay more for a sustainably produced product. But when it comes to the cash register, they're always buy, looking for the, the lower cost product to buy across the board. Um, a lot of cons younger consumers, however, are willing to forego convenience for sustainability. I mean, we haven't talked, uh, we, uh, we've talked a little bit about climate change. A lot of younger consumers really feel responsible for climate change and the our environmental future. Uh, so they want to purchase products that are sustainable because that's part of their contribution to, uh, to you know, alleviating the burden that we've been, that we've put on the planet. So the question is then, are they willing to pay more for uh, sustainable wines or do they have to? And that was what I set out to do. I um, am working on another book, a consumer guide to sustainable wine. And I wanted to be able to identify that. I mean, I know lots of great wines that are sustainably produced. Some of the most expensive wines in the world are certified biodynamic uh, or organic. Um, and I found a lot of wines that are under $20. Um, so uh, the question is, you know, how do we, how do we communicate that to consumers? That's really the challenge that I like uh, to present or for the wine industry. How do we, you know, communicate to consumers that there is high quality wine, good quality wine available at a price point that they can afford. And so that's, that's a big, question. Now, let me just say that, you know, when we talk about sustainability, I think you mentioned that one person wasn't going to show up because they're still confused about sustainability. I wish she uh, joined the call because of that, but yeah. I did not succeed so, in convincing her. I mean, you know, there are... Um, so I like to talk about uh, about certified sustainable and both and the speakers who preceded me talked about that. So anybody can say they're sustainable. I've met you know winemakers in different parts of the world. So oh, yeah, I'm sustainable because we have you know lots of bees that you know stay in our vineyard. But I like to talk about certified sustainable because that means you've gone through the rigor 
of, you know, documenting your spray, your spraying of chemicals, uh, documenting, um, you know, bottle weight, water usage, energy usage. So, and social equity, because nobody has actually mentioned that social responsibility to workers, your social responsibility to communities around the vineyard and around the wineries that are affected by your operation. So those are the kinds of things that certified sustainable wineries and vineyards are doing. And I think that's really important. We want, we want that kind of certification. It says, yes, indeed, we're following the rules. We've been audited by independent auditors. Uh, so we are actually uh, doing walking the talk. But now let's, but in terms of the future, you know, climate change is locked in, you know, as much as we've talked about this for decades and how we needed to address it, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a given, you know, the temperature, I think the IPCC, the, the committee, UN committee recently met and, you know, we're, we're not lowering the temperature uh, as we would need to. And so it's really important for the wine industry to take on this, take this on. And I think every a, a grape grower and every winemaker understands the importance of climate change and thinks about this every day in their operations. So the question is, what, you know, what's it going to take now? You know, you would assume most people understand organic, you know, because they buy organic produce in the grocery store. Biodynamic is maybe a little bit harder, certainly regenerative uh, agriculture uh, is it's going to be a bit more complicated. Uh, but I think the having the seals or indications on the bottle will help consumers, whether they understand all of the, the technical aspects of it or not. But you one would assume that organics would be um, less expensive. They're spending less on pesticides, less on herbicides. But in fact, uh, you know, the yield uh, in an an organic grower, their yield is less. And so they do it. So it's not, they can't necessarily pass on that savings to the consumer. Um, but, you know, there are lots of what I've discovered in my research is that there are hundreds of wines, as, as Stephanie mentioned, that are sustainable and that are up below $20, below $17. Uh, but, you know, New Zealand. Do you have percentages at all or, you know, regions or varietals, anything you can share specifically, Sandra, about yeah, those wines I would that are? say that, um, well, I mean, certainly there are a number from California and Washington State. Um, you know, I've looked across the globe. Uh, New Zealand wines are nearly 100% of New Zealand wines are certified sustainable, and many of them are affordable or under $20. Now, granted, exchange rates have, you know, have an impact for American consumers. Uh, many Chilean wines are, are, uh, under, are under $20. And again, exchange rates, labor costs, uh, make a difference. Land costs, uh, you know, unlike the cost of land in uh, California. So I don't, I don't have a percentage, but I certainly can say that you know we know that New Zealand wines are 100 percent sustainable. Now, not all of those wines are under twenty dollars, but a large number, a large percentage of them are for U.S. consumers. Um, so I think there are some choices, many choices out there for consumers of wines. Uh, and it's important. The reason why I'd like to talk about consumers, I mean, it's one thing for the industry to produce sustainably, but people have to buy it. I mean, we've got to sell uh, this wine to consumers. And I like to talk about brands that are high quality and affordable and for young consumers who want to shop their values because many young consumers, millennials, Gen Z, uh, Gen X's are really committed to purchasing products that are sustainably produced, even if they cost a little bit more. Uh, one of the things I learned uh, working in coffee is that people are people want to be, they want to know that they, we, they want the industry to help them understand how they can be more sustainable. Not everybody understands how to reduce their own personal environmental footprint. We're talking about a generation uh, that wants to reduce their environmental footprint. And I think it's up to the industry, the wine industry, to help them do that by communicating 
uh, that there are these great wines that are available that are affordable to them. Now, you know, if you can afford a $60 bottle of wine that is sustainable, then all, that's even better. But we understand a large number of consumers don't have that kind of budget. But I think the industry is producing those wines and we need to communicate that better to consumers. Could you talk about the other demographics? You've said millennials and yeah, young, younger demographics are very interested in sustainability. What about boomers, older people? Um, how are sustainable wines doing with that demographic? Well, I mean, I, I can't tell you specifically how they're doing in terms of percentages, but I think, you know, boomers, you, you know, my, my uh, estimation or my research, which is qualitative, uh, is that boomers wanted to know uh, you know, is it, does this wine taste good? Uh, what's the quality of this wine? Uh, and will it age? Um, so boom, that's so sustainability is not the first question, regrettably, that uh, boomers ask about wine. Um, so I think that they're they're learning from the younger generations the importance of sustainable wines. But again, boomers primarily want to know, does it taste good? And will it age? So tell us a little bit about the consumer guide you're working on, and then I will probably open it up to questions from the audience. Um, you know, well, part of that is really it's uh, I started a, I wrote a book on sustainability and wine. It pr probably is more directed toward the industry, how to build a brand of sustainability. Um, but the consumer guide really is designed to kind of break through some of the technicalities and explain sustainability more simply. Uh, but the, so that's part of it. But it's mostly just to share with them, you know, hundreds of wines that are sustainably produced, not all under $20, mind you, but across a whole range of regions. I mean, Italy, Spain, the US, Oregon, California, Washington, New York, uh, you know, New York State, there's a lot of wine that's being produced there, uh, Chile, Argentina. So I've looked at the entire world and identified wines that are sustainable, shared information about the grapes and about food pairing and prices. Prices is a little bit more complicated because of exchange rates. But um, so I basically, I'm assuming a US readership uh, that this is for the U.S. audience, so translating a lot of that into U.S. dollars. But the, the goal is really to help consumers better understand what does sustainability mean and then what are some of the wines that are on offer. And I'd love to have an app because I know that's how most people, uh, I mean, I've walked around wine shops and listened to people saying, oh, that's a Chilean wine. I think those are sustainable. Aren't they all sustainable? So there's still a lot of confusion in the marketplace about what sustainability means and what wines are indeed sustainable because there just aren't, as we as we talked, as you discussed earlier, there aren't necessarily indications on the bottle of sustainability. There are some regions that do have a seal on the neck. South Africa, for example, has a seal on the neck of the bottle. But again, the consumer has to even understand what that means. Uh, you know, IPW certified, what does that mean? Um, so there's gotta be a simpler way for people to get the information so that they're willing to purchase sustainable wines. Um, and, that, and we need that because that's the only way you know, we're going to continue to survive uh, as a sustainable wine industry. Thank you so much, Sandra. We're going to, because I don't see any questions for her at this point, hop over to Ryan Woodhouse. Um, Ryan's the domestic buyer for KNL. Probably everybody knows fabulous uh, three location store. There's one in San Francisco, one in Silicon Valley, and one down in LA, he's also been the buyer for international wines in the past, and he's going to address sustainability from a retail perspective and talk to us a little bit about what's going on at KNL. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, great discussion so far. Really enjoyed it. Um, so yeah, um, as Liza said, I've been at KNL for eleven years. I now buy the domestic wines for KNL, but used to buy wines from New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, Germany, Austria, Alsace quite the list now. Um, but yeah, this was also a really timely um, salon that we're doing today because we've actually really been making some changes in how we promote 
sustainable wines or actually I'll delve into this later, but more so organic biodynamic wines at mid KNL. We've had a filter on the website for a long time for the e-commerce channel. Um, that allows customers to filter by organic wines, but we have just recently set up physical sections in our retail stores, um, specifically dedicated to, to organic biodynamic wines. Um, the sustainability question for us, um, I think, you know, perhaps how we deal with sustainability talks to some of the challenges that uh, we previously talked about. There's still, I find, a lot of consumer confusion around sustainability. Um, one of the biggest challenges I think um, that faces it is um, linking the, the farming side with the energy usage, packaging, uh, water, et cetera. I think uh, from what I've seen with customers in store and different interactions, it's very easy to, to link the quality of what's in the bottle with, with farming practices, organics, biodynamics, et cetera. Um, but when you're looking at kind of slightly more broad topics of, uh, of energy, water, um, packaging, et cetera. I think it's harder for the customer to make a link uh, between the, the quality of the wine and you know, what, they're, what they're making their purchase based on. Um, and as touched on by some previous panelists, we definitely still see people looking for, is it, is it a great bottle of wine first? Uh, looking at the pedigree of the producer, um, vintage, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, you know, funny, uh, we, we titled this presentation about lower price point sustainable wines being a challenge. Um, I must admit, I'd kind of like to flip it on its head and say that certified sustainability is, is a huge opportunity, I think, for, for inexpensive wines. I think it's a way that people can push that to the forefront and actually make themselves stand out in that super competitive sector um, of inexpensive wines. It can be a huge selling point that perhaps, especially for a new brand, you know, may even be more important than, than the brand itself if they're not already established in the marketplace. Something to, to really put forward. Um, uh, again, like I mentioned earlier on, putting that seal on the front, making that a, making that a, real, a real selling point. Um, and yeah, I mean, the other thing, I, as I say, I think there, there needs to be a little bit more work done from our level, from the winery level of, of splitting out the different kind of aspects of, of sustainability so people can really tackle that. Um, there's also a lot of certifiers. So that's a thing that I've spoken to some of our staff about. Um, you know, so many different organizations, you know, the Salmon Safe, Live, Lodi Rules, the different things we've talked about today. So I think that the, the sheer number of different certifiers um, can be a little confusing for, for the average consumer. Um, are consumers showing more or less interest in sustainable wines? I mean, are you seeing an uptick? And if so, among what demographics, among what price points or varietals? Yes, I mean, I definitely, I've definitely witnessed an uptick in interest in organic and natural wines. Um, I, I will say, honestly, I've, I've not, had too many requests for sustainable wines. Uh, the language that the customers used for me at least seems to be a lot more rooted, organic, biodynamic, natural. Natural is perhaps something that's even harder to define than sustainable. Um, but so there's definitely this, this environmentally conscious um, you know, feeling, especially in our San Francisco location. I will say that was uh, the San Francisco location was the one that really kind of spearheaded this why is that? It surprises me. I mean, over Silicon Valley, over LA, I guess they're very different communities. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, yeah. Um, well, LA, I mean, they, they, they want natural skin contact wines uh, in LA. But as far as like uh, uh, the call for organic biodynamic wines, we've definitely seen that in San Francisco. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I haven't, I could check on the average age of customers, perhaps. I mean, we're located right there in uh, Atherton, Menlo Park, um, very high wealth area. A lot of folks have been there for a long time. <clears throat> Excuse me. So perhaps that makes a difference. Look, maybe perhaps a slightly newer generation of clientele. Interesting question from Paul, which is important. Are wholesalers communicating sustainable mm -hmm. factors and green factors to you, or are they leaving this to the producers? 
They do. Um, honestly, it's not normally something like high up on the level of importance. Um, it might it might make it on a on a tech sheet or on a kind of brand presentation, but very rarely is it um, the selling point um, that they bring to you about about a brand. Um, it's it's generally an afterthought. Um, there's a few exceptions, actually, fairly notably the um, the Shannon Ridge wines that we just recently brought on. That was one of the things in the forefront of the presentation. So um, yeah, and that was actually like right around the same time as we started lining up this uh, this salon. So. <clears throat> so, what are some of the recent trend lines for wines that fall under? We discussed sustainable, sustainably farmed, certified, organic, bio. Dynamic, eco-friendly. What are the top categories? Um, I'd say it's from all over. I see, um, you know, equal requests for domestic, international, um, across the broad spectrum of varietals. Um, I would, I would say there's definitely been um, just as much concern about what we're putting in our bodies versus what we're doing to the environment. So I think that's maybe where the the organic, organically grown grapes. Uh, seem to be getting some traction, you know, that consciousness of farming, chemicals, pesticides, et cetera, and, and really thinking about people's diet. Um, I, I must admit, I haven't seen personally too many people really shopping on a basis of like, you know, um, carbon, carbon neutral or environmental impact on a, on a global scale. For me, what I've seen an uptick in is folks looking at the, the farming, the soil. Um, and again, one of the things I said earlier, I think that's easier for people to link to the quality in the bottle, uh, you know, the higher quality of wine and are willing to pay a little more for it than perhaps like any tangible link between a certification of sustainability and quality in the bottle. I think that's, that, that would be a really interesting bridge to, to build to see if we can work on, uh, you know, that, consumer consciousness of, of quality and sustainability together. Um, and question on packaging, is packaging influencing consumer selection, lighter bottles, corks, alternatives? Mm -hmm. um, we just had um, uh, a producer in Paso Robles come out with a three liter uh, rosé um, for $94. So it's high end in a box, very, very high end. So. <laughs> um yeah i mean we've seen we've seen canned wines increase um i, I would still say like if people are going to buy a nice bottle of wine they still want it to be heavy uh, <laughs> so yeah we're, we're, we're swimming against the flow a little bit of sustainability on those things mm -hmm. I'm seeing just as many big monster bottles and very very elaborate over the top boxes um a, a, a winery that should remain nameless just delayed a recent shipment of wine to me for months and months and months because they couldn't they got boxes they weren't happy with and finally the wine came and we kind of immediately removed all the wine from the boxes and recycled them anyway um but yeah i mean it, it, it's um it's always a challenge yeah personally for the inexpensive uh tiers the sub 20 tiers i don't think there's too many worries about you know the, the physical aspects of the packaging uh, but if we're talking about elevated price points, then people, I think, still are looking for big, bulky, substantial packaging. What do we need or would you like to see from wholesalers and producers to get more sustainable wines on the shelves and to get more sustainable wines, uh, therefore, in the hands of consumers? Yeah, I mean, I still think there's work to be done on the messaging, as I said um, earlier on. And things, you know, things like we're doing here today are super, are super useful to that. Um, and uh, what Dr. Bolton showed earlier on today, kind of in-store displays and different things that actually break it down for people, I think are, are certainly really useful. We could definitely do a, a better job as a company, adding kind of additional features, additional signage, um, you know, to show sustainability specifically. I think there's just been a, a, a little bit of um, hesitation to do that until we feel like that concept is really fleshed out in our consumers' minds. But I mean, everything like we're doing here today is working towards, you know, making that a more powerful tool in the future. So I definitely think there's a huge opportunity here. And as I said earlier, I think it can be a real huge opportunity for inexpensive wines and emerging brands for sure. 
Uh, that's something that surprises me when I go into stores that I'm not seeing more built out sustainable sections. Um, I recently moved to Ashland, a small town in Southern Oregon, and actually our local, local supermarket has a huge organic section. It's the first thing you see when you come in. So that was that was really exciting. Um, are there challenges that you'd like to discuss at the retail level for, for marketing and, and messaging about sustainable wines? Yeah, I, I mean, just just the kind of ones which I uh, which I touched on. I think you know, in the in the previous conversation, um, I do think it would be useful to see some. I don't know whether this will ever happen, but some kind of centralized uh, sustainability. Um, you know, like New Zealand has a slightly more centralized certifier. I think it is difficult for consumers when you have so many different certifiers, and perhaps that can be cleaned up by education on sustainability as a whole. Um, but at some point, it would be interesting to see if there was, you know, a, a statewide, countrywide, some kind of codified certification for sustainability that was a little easier for people to identify. But then at the same time, I would say, you know, for brands uh, to have the confidence to to put that on the front label, like I mentioned at the very beginning of the conversation, you know, um, the guys at Shannon Ridge are obviously really, uh, you know, putting <laughs> put in their putting their uh, full efforts into saying this is really important and true to our brand. Um, I don't think it can just be a passing thing. You know, I think yeah, if you're doing it and you truly believe in it, you've, you've got to put it out there as one of your, your key selling points. Uh, is there anything else you want to touch on Ryan or do we have questions for Ryan about PNL? Anybody? It. Does anybody have a, um, questions for any of the other speakers. I just wanted to keep us on time, but we certainly have um, a few minutes. If I mean, I know Sarah has a lot of questions about packaging. I'm not sure if they all got addressed. Um, does I'll anybody raise, else? I'll raise a hand. One thing okay. I to bring up. <laughs> um, I remember this from my days when I was working in the, in the New Zealand category. Um, there was quite a few contentions um, down there with sustainable wine growers of New Zealand when um, certain things were deemed acceptable under the sustainability certification, certain, certain chemicals, certain practices that growers that were organic certified or whatever were very, very skeptical about, but they were kind of allowed to, hey, we, we used this that had a negative impact, but we did such and such to offset it. I think that's a part of sustainability, which I think we have to be careful with uh, in the in the consumer's mind. I like the whole carbon credits for companies and different things. I don't I don't think we want to go down a road where sustainability is like this selling feature that you can kind of buy and trade and kind of wiggle your way through. So <laughs> people like Dr. Bolton and the other certifiers, I would just hope to you know really good conversation with the growers and the farmers and and making sure that there isn't kind of too much flexibility that comes into to those aspects which might undermine um, people's views on sustainability. We had a question from, has it, Gustavo, do you still have a question? I saw a raised hand. I see it in the chat, I think. Okay. Yeah, I dropped it in the chat there for you, Ryan. Okay. The, 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 customer, uh, excuse me, the question is specific towards unfiltered wines as natural. So do customers <laughs> get a feeling or a sense that those wines that are unfiltered are more natural or tending towards that organic spectrum just by their uh, the way that they're making wine? Yeah, I mean, I think people could maybe see, see an appearance of a wine like that and assume it was a natural or organic wine. But I mean... Most of us here in the, you know, as industry professionals obviously know that's not the case. Uh, but, you know, natural wines, I think, are another wine, you know, type of wines that have a bit of an identity crisis where no one really knows exactly what they are. I've seen numerous different people try and write out a definition of that and, and I think fail miserably. Um, but, yeah, I mean, uh, yes, I see people looking uh, at, a, at the appearance of a wine and making assumptions. Um, but on the sustainability end, um, again, I think it's just, just an education um, and just tying up of some, some loose ends to really make it impactful. We have a few other retailers on the call and I'm interested, I don't know, Gary, would you or David or Emma like to share you know, your practices for how you identify and market these wines and educate your consumers, anyone? Gary, Gary do you wanna, Gary has, a, Three stores in New Jersey and uh, and a wonderful store up in Napa. Um, 
you've got to unmute yourself. Um, Paul's going to allow you to unmute yourself. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, first off, the store in Napa is very different than our New Jersey stores as far as what people are looking for. We get a lot of farmers and winemakers, and obviously their conversation is extremely different than the conversation we have with the guests coming in. I think that the general public is totally confused. Uh, I think, you know, do they understand what sustainable is, what organically grown grapes? So if they say, it says organically grown grapes, they say, well, is it organic? That's why the grapes are organic. Um, so I think we've done a great job at confusing the public, um, and they're asking questions, but they are here for a limited time. Uh, they're not willing to have a half an hour dialogue about organic versus biodynamic versus, uh, green or versus orange or so the challenge we have, our wine teams are educated enough to know the difference and to try to have succinct answers, but I think most of the answers cause more questions. Um, so it has clearly become a, a greater challenge. Um, and of course, to sustainable, you know, to the point of wood boxes, uh, we got the same wood boxes in and we're doing the same thing. We're taking these beautiful boxes and putting them aside and putting the wine in very uh, expensive cardboard shippers to ship them across the country. And we are, like the wineries, is not green as can be, talking about being green. So I think there's some hypocrisy going on in the wine world of green. Thank you, Gary. We also have Kathy Strange, um, one of the wine buyers at Whole Foods. And um, I'd love, Kathy, if you're comfortable, to get some insight from you. You guys have definitely made an impression with this category. How are you marketing these wines and communicating to consumers? Hi, everyone. Um, amazing information being exchanged on this call. And we we are piloting uh, in the next coming year and with this organization uh, defining baseline standards around, um, well, sustainability, as Sandra pointed out, it, we're validating through other aspects, all sustainability, not specific, just agriculture and winemaking, but how it all fits together. We feel like that's going to be a very important message going forward. Uh, currently, we're uh, integrating um, products into sets, and we're also defining unique sets that call out eco-friendly at this point in time until we get further clarification and definition that the industry aligns on that we could effectively communicate. And I, I think the uh, gentleman that just recently uh, spoke about his stores is that is a very long engaging conversation that happens on many levels. And it depends on the education level of the consumer, the, the amount of questions that we deal with in the Whole Foods market environment is quite dense. It's not top three questions. It's gonna be 10 questions deep. Right, and so we have to be prepared uh, to have a complete understanding of how we're gonna respond to that and how we're gonna classify that. But uh, we are looking forward in the next year um, to certainly define a little bit more along with the, the sustainable wine group direction, including that, aligning with that, and then adding categories to be able to uh, specifically explain and educate our customers about if it's this in our set, what we're calling it, what we certify within our environment and Whole Foods, what uh, the government certifies and recognize uh, specifically around organic classifications. There's a lot of complexities, as you all know. So uh, we, we call it out and we integrate with the main set. So I think it's a combination at this point. And the level of interest also pointed out. The West Coast, uh, a lot of interest in around very specific areas. The questions that get asked in our Colorado stores are very different from Florida, from New York, uh, from Pacific Northwest. So uh, it's crafting a message that could be applicable to all of the customers that are based on very sound uh, methods that validate what the what our um, you know direction is. I hope that helps. Happy to answer any questions. <laughs> um, any any questions for for Kathy? Paul's also pointing out too that sustainability really needs a, a, 
visible elevator pitch labels and environmentally positive highlights like pork, um, recyclability, things like that. Jeff, any thoughts about what you're doing at the PCC? It's it's a local Seattle chain um, focused on, on natural, you know, or, organic foods and wines and pretty progressive. Yeah. Oh, Ben, you have a question? Ben, did you have a question? You have to unmute yourself. There we go. I can't hear you. Yeah. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, I just, I had a call to action because I think there's one clarification that I wanted to make is we as, as larger wineries still don't make wine for end consumers. We're making wine for the retailers and uh, we're making wine that you accept into your stores. So I think, and, and going off of what Ryan said, if I, I call you all, since you're all here to action, to look at the bottles that you are looking at and to look at the labels and the corks and understand what impact you're having on your buying decision. Cause ultimately that impacts what I'm buying. Um, you know, when Gary said you're taking bottles out of shippers, that hurts because that's a lot of energy that puts into the shippers. And I know that happens, but you know, if we can have better communication on, on where we can eliminate waste between retail and producer, I think that is where this conversation needs to go. And Sandra has a question or a thought. Yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, up until now, this, you know, sustainability in the wine industry started with the growers. It started in Lodi, actually, and then spread to growers in New Zealand. It started with the growers. So the, it wasn't that we were responding to activists or climate change. This started long before we were even talking about climate change. So I just wanted to congratulate, you know, the industry for doing a great job. So now we're, and we're at a tipping point. I mean, there are sustainability certification programs in just about every uh, wine growing, major wine growing region in the world. So now that the industry has uh, taken this on and is really making great progress. Now we need to start to communicate to retailers and help retailers communicate with consumers. But I, but I'm just really, I'm proud of the industry, and I just wanted to say I think we've done a good job of you know integrating sustainability into grape growing and winemaking, and not in response to any pressure really, uh, but just because the industry felt it was the right thing to do. So now we're at a point where we need to help, you know, the marketplace really understand this and value what the industry has done. So I just think it's important for us to, you know, we, of course, it's very confusing for consumers, but now this is a priority because the industry, I think, has made a lot of progress uh, up until this point. And did you have another question? or comment, and then I think we'll probably wrap up. So you have to unmute, Ben. Oh, no? Okay, you're good. Anyway, I wanna thank you all for your time, for all the great insight. This was really fantastic. Thank you all for joining us. And I think Paul has a few closing comments. Yeah, I, once again, I, I echo Liza's comments and you know, all of our panelists here have put forward some really, really, really in-depth um, information about you know, what needs to happen for sustainability to succeed. And we can all play a role in that as retailers, as producers, as certifications and experts on certification to be able to communicate a more consumer friendly message. You know, at the end of the day, like Ben said, this is all about agriculture. We don't have jobs if there's no wine industry essentially in the next 50 years. So um, human resources, natural resources have to be understood as being cared for and protected. Certifications help do that. Um, helping forests stay alive, help natural materials still be part of the process, uh, making sure that reusability, recyclability, upcycling is all part of ways in which we can keep things in the circularity chain. Um, I think at the end of the day, if, if the approach to wine uh, mimics the approach to food, people will start to understand how important it is um, when it comes to that consumer choice. Um, we want to thank every single one of you. We will be doing another salon on July 28th, um, as well as throughout the course of the year, um, addressing different elements of the sustainability issue. Um, and we really, really hope that you enjoyed this. Uh, follow up and invitation. If there are any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to my team at Calandron Partners on behalf of APCOR. Um, and thank you again, Dr. Bolden, Ben, Sandra, um, Ryan, for being able to join us. And Liza, as moderator, you did an incredible job. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.
Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Pleased to be Thank a part you. of it. Thank Take you. care. Bye.